Thank you all so much. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I've never done back-to-back -back panels before, so we'll see how this goes. Um, but I'm really excited that we're starting off uh, with these two gentlemen. And uh, we just did actually a really great panel backstage. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and, and we're going to try to do it again for you now. But they, uh, they're really, really um, smart guys. And, and I've talked to them both before for, for stories. And, and I'm delighted to be here with them. Uh, governor Markell, we'll start with you since you are a, uh, a closer to us governor than Michigan. Um, and uh, even though uh, Governor Engler is in the district now. Um, this is a big problem. And this is a problem that, that we we've been talking about trying to solve on every level of government. But you were saying backstage, if the, if the Congress can't do something about it, trust us, we're, we're working on stuff in the states. Tell us what, that's, what that is. What does it mean to be working on these problems at the state level? OK, so uh, first of all, thanks for uh, having me. And uh, the most important thing we can do in the states is be so appreciative that we have an unbelievable crowd of people here. Uh, because government can't do this alone. The business community can't do this alone. Uh, and the, uh, the not-for-profit sector can't do it alone. We really all have to work uh, together. It is a huge problem, not just for those who are you know, not in school or not working, but as, most, as, as many parents know these days, there are plenty of kids who are in school and not getting jobs as well. And so we're approaching this from a, a number of perspectives. First of all, I just stepped down after three years as chair of a fantastic organization called Jobs for America's Graduates. It exists in over 30 states across the country. It's been around for 30 years. And it focuses on the kids who are most at risk of dropping out of high school. And 30 years in, 30 states, year in, year out, 90 plus percent success rate of uh, kids graduating and a year later, 80 percent being in school or working. And you know, it really focuses on these kids while they're in school. Uh, they all have a specialist. It's like a class that they take where they teach job skills, where they work on all of the the, the soft skills as well as some of the harder skills as well, really important. We've got a great organization in Delaware, it's represented here today, IT Works, Tech Impact, uh, that does an amazing job of working with at-risk kids and giving them training on uh, computer skills and then landing them jobs uh, afterwards. But we couldn't do this kind of work if we didn't have partners in the business sector, businesses that are willing to give these ch kids a chance, a chance at a job, a chance at an interview, uh, mentoring along the way, and so we are just really encouraged by all the opportunities we have in government to work with our institutions of education, our employers, uh, and the not-for-profit sector. Governor Engler, I, I want to ask you a, a variation of one of my favorite questions, one of the big um, research interests that I have and that I ask uh, economists and policymakers all the time. So we live in an era where uh, capital is very mobile, both, both across state lines but also across international lines, where there are more and more opportunities to invest in software and robots and automation as opposed to labor, and where we are looking at a global economy that is still finding its feet years and years after the recession ended. So the question I usually ask is, why, why would a business create a job in America today? And I want to go one step further and say, why would you hire a young person in America today? What are businesses, what is it about America's young people that will make them be a good investment for America's business? And what do they need to get to be sure. better at that? Well, I think uh, the Business Roundtable, the organization I represent, uh, 200 plus CEOs leading many of them global companies. So they, uh, they hire all over the world. Uh, primarily all of them are headquartered still in the United States, but they're uh, the revenues come from sales and investments everywhere. So they get a chance to see the whole global workforce today. Uh, you still want to be an American company for a lot of reasons. Uh, the rule of law that's here, uh, liquid capital markets, uh, uh, regulatory system that generally speaking is predictable, uh, and talent. Talent was always a, a big <coughs> advantage. I think it's widely viewed that the United States has still the best higher education system in the world. It's not true with the K-12 system at all anymore. That's, that has lost ground, comparatively speaking. We are improving in K-12 compared to where we were five years ago, 10 years ago. Gradual improvements. Rest of the world's moving faster. They're having more success. And the mastery of mathematics and science and technical skills. So that represents a threat down the road. 
your question is really important because today there's a preference to be here. But it's like, uh, well, all right, Major League Baseball, spring training is underway. Uh, there was a big deal made of the Boston team signing a Cuban star for a lot of money. The baseball general managers are looking for the best talent where they can find it in the world. The basketball playoffs are soon to start. Last year, the uh, Spurs won the championship. Players from seven or eight different nations. Best talent in the world. It's that way in business today. It's the best talent in the world. And one of the challenges we've had in uh, a conversation with the American public about higher standards is uh, people will look in the mirror and say, well, you know, hey, we're doing pretty good. My school's a lot better than that school on the other side of the county. My school is certainly a lot better than these schools in the other part of the state. And at the state level, some states will say, well, our schools are better than this other state. It's not the right comparison today. You're competing with the best schools anywhere in the world. And the company, the people who's going to put capital at risk, is competing for the best talent in the world. And so that's where we have to measure. And there's been a lot of resistance to that. I, I don't want to be measured. I don't want to work uh, that hard, or I don't want to do this. Well, today we've got an advantage. It's an advantage, though, that, could lose, that we could lose. We could slowly see that erode. It's the old story that if you throw a frog in the pot of boiling water, it'll pop right back out. If you cook the frog slowly, it'll stay there and you can boil your frog. You know, <laughs> what we've got to be is, I think, alert to what that challenge is. So a lot of reasons why today it makes sense. Uh, and there are, because of other factors, the energy advantage that America and, and indeed all of North America has today. Uh, there, there are reasons why you'd want to be in the U.S. or in North America, but all of those are subject to competitive pressures which don't just stay the same. Governor, do you, do you think that um, young workers, particularly out of work, would-be workers, uh, have a, a lack of skills that is holding them back, or is there a lack of available jobs, or both? Well, if you don't have this, I mean, put it this way, um, there has never been a better time to be somebody with the right skills. But there's probably never been a worse time to be somebody without the right skills. And I know we've got, a, you know, 250 young people here today. And so, you know, my message to you is you go out and develop the skills. You will take control of your future. There are plenty of jobs for people with the, with the skills. I mean, literally, there are millions of jobs. In, in our small state, I could point to, you know, a couple employers name by name that have hundreds and hundreds of jobs that they can't fill. Uh, because they can't find people with the right skills. So what do we do about it? You know, par part of the issue we have uh, in, in our state, for example, a lot of banks, and they have a lot of technology jobs. And they tell me that their, human, their, their recruitment strategy is largely to hire away from each other, which is a lousy recruitment strategy. So what we've done is we've brought together the banks, our institutions of education, um, uh, some entrepreneurs in the state to figure out a, p a path to get people trained faster. You know, a four-year degree is great, a two-year degree is great, but a lot of jobs these days, you can do well if you get a short, intense, appropriate training. You earn a credential, you earn a, earn a certificate, and there are jobs for you. So I expect this fall as an example, we're gonna be starting up, and, and again, IT Works, uh, Tech Impact, is leading the charge to create a coding school, where instead of a two-year degree, somebody will attend for probably 15, 16 weeks you know, dozens and dozens of hours a week, but the, at the end, they're going to leave with a real skill. So we've seen tr training expenditures by business fall uh, across the economy over the last uh, decade or so. Um, Governor, is, is, is that something that um, we should be expecting the public sector to pick up the slack on, more of a public-private partnership? How should that work? Sure. Um, let, me, let me start by commenting also on the question that you asked Governor Markell, because I think that that's really goes to the heart of it, because today, uh, if someone has skills, someone has training, there's almost 100% chance you can go to work. But that's different. Uh, skills and competencies, training, is, is different than saying you've got a degree. Mm -hmm. Because increasingly, the questions are being asked, what does the degree even mean? What does it represent? And, and there's been almost a peer pressure and a, I would say in some ways, a societal pressure. I'm from Michigan. There were, there were parents who had uh, very good jobs, maybe in the industry, but we're saying to the 
youth in the family, oh, son and daughter, you need to go to college. Well, that, that may be the right decision, but not everybody needs to go to college, but everybody has to have a skill. And, and, and so there are jobs, if you might say my priority is to make a lot more money sooner, you might get those quicker uh, by getting a, a specialized training and taking one of the jobs that might be in one of the companies that Governor Markell mentioned. You might wish to be a welder. I mean, they're sixty to eighty thousand dollars, and uh, with the overtime they've been working, it's not uncommon to see them go past a hundred thousand dollars in parts of the country. Uh, you might like to climb a utility pole. That workforce is aging. Those are again jobs that once you're uh, on those jobs, sixty, seventy thousand dollar incomes. Now, how does that compare to somebody who goes to college for four or five years? And remember, half the people who go to college in America they don't finish. They don't graduate. So, so in effect, you, you know, you're going to then go back and maybe start the training along with your student loans that now need to be serviced. But if you get a general studies degree and it doesn't represent any specialized skills and you can't represent it as such, are, are you employable or not? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. The, the question you asked me, I'll, I'll give you an example of a program real close to here, Northrop Grumman, uh, and Wes Bush, the CEO of Northrop Grumman, is a leads our workforce efforts at the Business Roundtable. Uh, they have an advanced cybersecurity experience for students it's called ACES. It's at the University of Maryland. Uh, Northrop Grumman put a $1.1 million grant from their foundation into the program. It focuses on individual study at the undergraduate level, but it cuts across a diverse a group of majors, computer science, math, engineering, business, criminology. They get a, an endorsed transcript when they finish that program, 100% of those young people are getting hired. I mean, they go to work right now, no question. So, so it's important as education consumers to ask the education supplier, what evidence is there that I'm employable if I complete this program? What is the experience? And that's data that hasn't generally been available. There's more innovative things coming from governors in this area across the country to now try to help create almost the consumer report for the education consumer. And if I could add, add to that, and I just think about the people in this room, there's a role for everybody to play. So first of all, for the young people, it's easy for us to say, go get a skill, but you have to spend some time studying to figure out which skills are most valued in the place where you want to work. It's not that complicated. I mean, generally, the more technical, the more computer science, the more uh, you know, engineering, it doesn't mean four-year engineering, but you, you need to figure out what skills are valued in your marketplace, and there are plenty of resources in your states to figure that out. Your departments of labor have labor market uh, information offices. To the employers, you have a critically important role to play here. And this is, I'm not asking you to do this out of altruism. This is not about charity. I mean, this is about your very competitiveness in the future. Because the only way any of you are going to be successful in the future is if you have the most talented workforce possible, and you have a role to play. Some of that's going to be the, the training you provide yourselves, but some of it's going to be making sure you sit down with the education providers uh, in, in your states. And then I know we have a lot of foundations <coughs> in the room as well. You have a role to play. And as people are seeking your, uh, your, your resources, you've got a role to play to make sure that everybody else is communicating, that everybody else is collaborating. Because it doesn't make, it, it doesn't make any sense for a community college to come up with some new program that sounds good, sounds sexy, if they don't have employers in their state who are ready to take the graduates when they get out. And I think that those with resources have a way of forcing that conversation. Last year, the president signed the Workforce Opportunity and Investment Act, and it was actually a, an interesting bill because it was bipartisan in the Congress. Republicans and Democrats worked together on this. Uh, Vice President Biden was quite involved. But the whole idea is to kind of attempt to help on the challenge that Governor Markell just laid out to get better information out into the communities. Every, every inch of America has a workforce board that services that area. And, and we think that there's a need to have those workforce boards which represent, uh, and the new act will enhance this representation of kind of what, what's the employer community looking for. We would, as we look in our mirror, we say the employer community's gotta do something the governor just said. We've gotta do a better job of trying to define what are the competencies and the jobs where the opportunities are? What are, what are, what are we needing? And, and that isn't done systematically across the country. It isn't done well in a lot of places. That's an area where we think we definitely need to improve. 
at the same time, we need to communicate that to the student who's, who's getting an education, and we need to communicate it to the trainer, the teacher, the, the education provider, so that they're not teaching uh, an obsolete skill, and you're taking it, you're at the top of the class, you are the best student learning an obsolete skill. No opportunity to go to work. Right. And so we need to get, there's an alignment that's needed, but you still are out there as consumers of education to the youth here, and to anybody who's able to influence this in the community, we need to do a, a better job. And the other thing we also know we should do is we can tell all of our friends dropping out Leaving is, is the single most catastrophic decision that one can make in life, not, not finishing. And uh, so, a lot to do. Yeah. So, okay, first up, I want to thank uh, Governor Engler for um, satisfying the constitutional requirement that if you're on a panel with the governor of Delaware, you must say something nice about Joe Biden. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, I also then want to ask sort of a, a, a question that pivots off the skills question, because we hear this a lot. We hear about skills gaps. We hear about jobs not being filled. But the fact of the matter is we've also had a really weak economic recovery in the last five years, and there haven't been a lot of jobs created. Now, that's accelerated over the last year in particular. But for young people who graduated, even some with the right skills, into this economy, there, it is a definite disadvantage compared to their parents or even people who graduated 10 years before. Right. How do you handle that? How do you, how do you pick up those young people who want to work and just were unlucky in, in terms of the economic circumstances into which they enter the workforce. Well, I think that's right, and I think it's right for two reasons, and, and uh, Governor Engler references. I mean, first of all, there are two major structural forces at work. One, businesses have more choices than they have ever had before about where to hire. And jobs that 30 years ago that by default would have gone to the U.S. or Canada or Western Europe or Australia, now employers have literally dozens of choices all around the world. That's force number one. Force number two is we all carry you know, with us these unbelievably powerful computers in our pocket. And the fact is, business, I mean, we, every state has businesses that are producing twice as many things as they did 10 years ago with half as many employees. The role of people in the workforce is just changing. Th that, is, that, is, that, is, that is reality. And so that being said, I mean, we do now have 59 straight months of job growth, and I, and I really urge, I mean, in the end, you know, teachers, administrators, counselors, government can do so much for you. We, and we have to try to meet you more than halfway. But in the end, you can, as difficult as it is, you can control your own destiny. Tom Friedman from the New York Times, you know, writes that average just is not good enough anymore. Showing up is not, and, and as a parent myself of a 22-year-old and 19-year-old, it's a conversation we have all the time. You may be, you know, on the one hand, you, you refer to the students these days as being unlucky to be in this economy. Uh, that may be, but that's, this is the real world. And you can change those dynamics because, again, the unemployment rate for folks, for young people with the kinds of technical skills that are valued in the marketplace and who can communicate and who can think critically and, and who can work in a team, that unemployment rate's real low. Yeah. It's real low. And so that's, those are the facts, and you, ha you, you, have to, you have to act accordingly given those facts. That being said, there's an incredibly important role for employers and foundations and government and institutions of higher education to play, with, to, to, to play as well. But in the end, you've got to take control of your own destiny. There's no question we've had a period of slow economic growth, even with the hiring. We're, we're coming back. We've still got a low labor force participation rate. That, that is, for young people, though, that's perhaps an opportunity. Uh, McKinsey's out with a study, their Global Institute, just in January, and it was kind of an interesting one because they looked at what's it take to get growth. We're, and we like the Business Roundtable to be viewed as the leading advocate for economic growth in the country. Well, McKinsey said, look, in the past, labor force really was a driver of growth, but labor force leveling off. The one thing young people have got going for is demographics. The, the workforce is graying, it's aging, and there's going to be lots of opportunities. In fact, uh, more than anything, you actually worry, are, are there going to be shortages? There clearly are five million un, four to five million unfilled jobs today, uh, be, and the governor mentioned those, so I won't go back at, at that, but there's, there, there are jobs, though, that de demand specific skills, knowledge, competencies, so you just can't walk in off street, here I am. Uh, 
what can you do? Well, nothing. Uh, business is spending billions, by the way, on training, but that isn't ad adequate enough. And, and since you're spending you know, many of your dollars or you're taking out loans, uh, make sure you're getting the right training. But, so I think the opportunities are there. Uh, the other thing I think is working for you is the infusion of new technology as we think, where does the other piece, where does growth come from? Well, then the other piece that's sort of productivity, where does that come from? Well, that, that is uh, adaption, adoption of new technology that's there and creation of additional new uh, technologies, approaches, processes. And, and for a developed economy, I mean, we're on the leading edge of implementing technology change. Uh, a developing nation's got a lot more work to do, but for us, we're, we're gonna be depending on then the innovation, the creativity, and hence the governor's mentioned on the sciences, the relationship to that, to the future is very, very important. Well, I wanna thank you both so much, and thank everyone for your attention. Uh, gentlemen, thanks, this was great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Over there. See ya.